Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account. Where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hello, saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 59, for broadcast on the 14th of August, 2019. Coming up on Space Time, studying how massive stars are made, a new tool to examine the earliest galaxies. And SpaceX plans its first astronaut flights before the end of the year. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers are studying an unusual stellar nursery, which is rapidly collapsing and giving birth to massive stars. These observations will help scientists better understand how some of the biggest stars in the universe are formed. The massive molecular gas and dust cloud being studied, catalogued as BYF73, is located about 8,000 light years away in the southern constellation of Carina the Keel. The research being undertaken by Dr. Stuart Ryder from Macquarie University shows the clouds collapsing at a rate of about 3% of the sun's mass every year, and that's one of the highest rates ever recorded. Ryder says these really big molecular clouds are rare, and the similar but smaller clouds aren't likely to make such big stars. Mind you, massive stars are fairly rare these days too, making up just a few percent of all stars. Astronomers think the really big O and B spectrotype blue stars usually only form in significant numbers through the collapse of really large molecular clouds, just like BYF-73. BYF-73 was discovered during a survey of more than 200 molecular gas clouds. Ryder thinks that as the cloud continues to collapse in on itself, it'll probably form a huge stellar cluster. He believes clouds like this allow astronomers to test theories of massive star cluster formation in great detail. Ryder's latest observations have been taken aboard SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, a converted Boeing 747 SP jumbo jet airliner operated by NASA and the German Aerospace Center DLR. The rear section of the aircraft has been specially modified to house a 2.5 metre infrared telescope. By flying at altitudes of around 14 kilometres, Sophia gets a clearer view of infrared light that would otherwise be blocked out by the atmosphere from reaching the ground. In fact, to get a better infrared view, you'd really have to go into orbit. The aircraft's usually based in California, but once a year it sets up shop in Christchurch, New Zealand, in order to fly missions looking at southern skies. And this year, Sophia is carrying a new instrument called the High Resolution Airborne Wideband Camera Plus, or HAWK for short. Hawk allows astronomers to study light in the far infrared spectrum and measure its polarization. Ryder says by looking at the polarization of the light coming in from BYF-73, astronomers can study the cloud's magnetic fields, and that may help explain why the cloud's collapsing so quickly. So the main focus of our observing program was a collapsing gas cloud called BYF-73, and this particular object, in fact, has the highest gas in full rate of any cluster or gas cloud that we know of in our galaxy. It's something like one thousandth the mass of our sun collapsing down every year. What this suggests is that there should therefore be one of the most active sites of star formation in the Carina region. Now bits of it are, but other sections of it we've found don't seem to be forming stars at all. And so we suspect that something is holding that gas up from further an ultimate collapse to begin star formation. And we think that something is magnetic fields. But the only way to be sure about that is to measure the strength of the magnetic field in these regions. And that's an observation that uh, has really only recently become possible at the very long wavelengths 
of light or heat radiation that we need to see deep into this cloud. But thanks to the, the ability of Sophia to fly above most of our atmosphere, up in a region where we're now sensitive to the infrared radiation that allows us to see deep into this cloud. And by making a map of what we call polarimetry, that is measuring the polarization of the radiation, the more stronger the magnetic field in these regions, the more the radiation is polarized. And so by using something like Sophia, you get above the, I guess, the moisture in the atmosphere, which prevents normal ground-based observatories from being able to study infrared. Yeah, that's exactly right. Even from our highest ground-based observatories, something like uh, the Mauna Kea observatories on Hawaii, they're about 4.2 kilometers above sea level. But even there, there's still large chunks of the infrared spectrum that are completely blocked to us because of water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere above Mauna Kea. But by making observations from altitudes of 40,000 feet all the way up to almost 45,000 feet from Sophia, it's almost as good as going being able to do these observations from space. But it's a lot cheaper, and it enables us to fly state-of-the-art instrumentation that satellite observatories typically don't take because their, their hardware needs to be pre-qualified for space travel before you launch something into space. And so there's a very long development cycle on that. But the nice thing about Sophia is that we can build and test new instruments put them on the plane, take them up to altitude, see how they work, and if there's any problem, we can just bring the plane back down again, fix the problem, and go fly another night. And one of the new instruments aboard Sophia is the High Resolution Airborne Wideband Camera Plus. Uh, yeah, that's Hawk Plus. It's a fantastic new infrared camera, but what makes it particularly unique is that that plus capability, if you like, is this ability to make polarization measurements. Some people may remember the, the very early generation of Polaroid sunglasses, which were made use of this polarization method to, in order to, in this case, screen out a harsh glare from sunlight reflecting off water or from windows and things like that. But we can use the same principles of polarization, in this case, to tell us what the, how the, and particularly how the dust grains in these clouds are aligned, because the dust grains are very sensitive to the alignment and strength of magnetic fields. So that's the connection, therefore, between making a polarization map and then being able to use that to tell us about the, the direction and the strength of magnetic fields that might be holding these gas clouds up against further collapse. And what does that tell you about what's happening inside these clouds by studying the magnetic field and how they're affecting the clouds overall? Because we find that in some regions of BYF-73, there's, there's quite prodigious and active star formation, but in areas not too far away from that, even though there's still lots of gas coming in, stars just don't seem to be forming at those locations. So we really want to apply this discrimination technique to see whether is it magnetic fields that are the key to unlocking the mystery of where and when star formation happens, or is there yet another factor involved that we don't fully understand that determines exactly where the next generation of stars will form. And the maps that we obtained with the Hawk Plus instrument uh, will be a very important clue to helping us uh, determine whether magnetic fields are the missing link in all of this, or indeed if there's yet other factors that come into play that we still don't fully understand. It gets down to conditions that are optimal for gas being able to condense and be brought together to such high temperatures and densities that nuclear fusion begins to take place and a star is born, so to speak. And so factors like magnetic fields mean that, for instance, uh, particles which become electrically charged, they find it very difficult difficult to just pass right through these magnetic fields. They're sort of forced to follow the field lines, but like iron filings uh, around a, a bar magnet would align, uh, but they couldn't go in any other direction that they might want to. So magnetic fields could potentially play a very important role in determining how the ultimate fate of gas turning into stars. That's Dr. Stuart Ryder, an astronomer at Macquarie University in Sydney. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. First light's been achieved using new technology designed to help astronomers determine the distances and ages of distant galaxies. Measuring distances and ages in the universe is a real problem. That's because the brightness of a star or galaxy doesn't actually tell you anything about how old it is. Now, astronomers can bypass this problem by measuring the Doppler shift of light coming from distant galaxies, something they refer to as redshift. The universe is expanding out from a Big Bang. And this expansion, known as the Hubble Constant, is causing things to move further and further away from each other over cosmic distances. It's a bit like painting a bunch of dots on a deflated balloon. Then the more you inflate the balloon, the further apart the dots become. 
This expansion is universal and directly related to distance, so the greater the distance, the greater the rate of expansion appears to be. This expansion of space-time also causes wavelengths of light to expand, shifting them more and more towards the red end of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the redder the light, that is, the more it's red-shifted, the faster the galaxy is receding from us, and therefore the further away it is. Now, unfortunately, this redshift of many galaxies in the early universe can't be measured in visible light. That's because starlight shaded by dust clouds surrounding these galaxies, so there's heaps of dust between the astronomer's telescope and the galaxy they're trying to study, and that's causing an effect known as reddening. So, measuring the redshift of these very distant galaxies requires observing in the far infrared part of the spectrum, which can peer through the dust. And that's where this new technology, called Tashima, comes in. Tashima is simply a specially designed silicon chip the size of a couple of coins. But what it does is quite amazing. It can measure 49 shades of far infrared light using an antenna that captures radiation at various wavelengths. It then feeds this through 49 filters that unravel the radiation in 49 tons of infrared, and then 49 detectors that measure the intensity of that radiation. For an astronomer, what it means is that when the detector picks up the signal, it can be seen as a peak on a graph. A report in the journal Nature Astronomy says the first tests with Tashima attached to a telescope have been promising. Developed in the Netherlands and mounted on a Japanese telescope in Chile, Tashima was initially tested on Mars, Saturn and a number of well-known stars and galaxies before focusing on the well-known distant galaxy Double V Double One Four. And so far, the tests have all proven most positive. So much so that a bigger version with heaps more detectors is now in the planning stages. Astronomy is very much a science of discovery. And every time we have a new telescope, or a new instrument. We discover something new. And Deshima is a new instrument in that same tradition. The youngest universe is at this moment the last frontier. So this is where the, the, white, the white spaces on the map begin, right? And we would like to fill in that last frontier. It is in the end the ultimate question of where we are coming from. Everything you see around you and everything you're made of has been part of the inside of a star because all the elements heavier than, uh, than hydrogen are coming from supernova explosions or reactions inside stellar cores in the history of the universe. So if you want to understand what we are, where we come from, where we're going to, this is one of the most relevant questions you can try to answer. And then we're really looking at the first light in the universe. When did the first galaxy form? When did the first star form? When did the light go on in the universe? We are now at the stage where we can really address the question of the whole history from the first star, first galaxy, to where we are now. And Deshima exactly does that. It is a new scale to sort out the galaxies that we see on sky, put it in the right position, give heroes, the monsters in the history of our universe, the really prominent ones that produced a lot of stars in the right time. We're writing history of our universe. And Deshima is a very efficient tool for doing that. The backstory of, uh, of Deshima is that uh, about eight years ago, there was a postdoc from Japan, Akira Endo, who came to the Netherlands to the group of Teun Klapwijk, who was then a professor in Delft. And he did it because he liked the way that Teun was working on detectors for astronomy. So Akira came to me and what he wanted to do, he wanted to be able to see how far the galaxies outside of our own galaxy are. Because we can make a picture, but the picture only gives us a two-dimensional view of what is out there. It doesn't tell us if something is very close by or something is very, very far away. So you have to find a trick because you cannot just measure how bright something is because you can have something very, very bright, very far away, but it, it, then it appears closer by, right? So this is very difficult. But the, the, the surprising thing in a way of how our universe works is that if a galaxy is farther away, something that was yellow when it was very close by becomes more and more red when it is farther away. So that means if I'm able to measure the exact color of these specific colors emitted from the galaxies, I know how fast it moves away from us. And since the universe is basically a big explosion, something that is going fast away from us has been going fast from the beginning of time, which basically means it is very, very far away now. So there is a direct relation between how red shifted, we call that, this specific color is gotten and how far away the galaxy is. 
So by looking further back, you can basically look back into history. So astronomy in a way is a time machine. What do you need? You need a system that is able to measure color. Not like that you can say, Moi, this is blue, Moi, this is green. You want to do that in a really precise way. So you want to be able to measure not roughly the color, but exactly the color. Then I thought, oh, wait a second. We have something very new here in Delft that we have developed in the past 10, 20 years. For all the astronomical projects, we have superconducting materials and they allow us to make electronics to measure the color. So we just make a electrical circuit of super superconducting materials that allows us to measure the color on something which is not a meter by a meter by a meter but something that is as small as a fraction of it. and that's how this whole thing got started and we came up with this very modern topic of mapping out the distant universe the cosmos with an instrument with with a chip i wrote down the science case uh, akira endo wrote down the technical case and submitted a proposal to uh, nwo uh, and it was accepted so all of a sudden we had an idea was turning into a project. So in 2017, we had for the first time a spectrometer chip where we had a nice continuous spectrum, that all the channels were there, that between 320 and 380 gigahertz, we collected all the power over that frequency range in individual spectrometers. So that was the, really the first chip that worked. And we at some point said, well, you know, what we have to find out is if we bring this thing to Chile, do we see something? Can we actually see that planet right away? We just take point a telescope to it and we scan over the planet. Can we see the signal from the planet right away? That calculation turned out to be, okay, that should be possible with a, with a reasonable margin. And then we said, okay, let's go. It's one of the very few places on the planet where you can actually see this far infrared radiation from these very far away galaxies. You need to go to a place which is very high and very dry. And on the whole planet, there are maybe four or five observatories where you can go to. And we were able to go to ASTA because of the collaboration we have with Japan. Here we take an approach that we use cutting edge physics and technology on the nanoscale to tackle mysteries and solve problems on the largest scale of our world. This is cosmology and astronomy. It's a very wide band spectrometer, one or two orders of magnitude wider band than spectrometers that exist now. That means that you can point the Shima at a particular galaxy that you have no idea of the redshift and can rapidly determine the redshift of that galaxy and go to the next one. This has been very difficult with uh, existing technology and the Shima tries to make a breakthrough there. It is absolutely not trivial that when you have something in a laboratory working and you throw it in a bunch of crates, you put it on a plane and then on a truck, and this truck drives for 2,000 kilometers to the Chilean end, as you drive up to 5,000 meters, you bolt everything back together and then you just hope that everything still works, right? The amount of things that can go wrong is, is immeasurable almost, right? Uh, currently, I'm amazed that it's really going according to plan. Everybody's working so well. Very excited. Tomorrow, we will see if the detectors are alive or not. And if they're alive, we're just on track. First light means in astronomy that you built an instrument and it's the first time it detects a photo, not from some calibration source you have in your lab, but from a real astronomical object. When we pointed after lots of tests there and verifying it was behaving in Chile as good as it was doing in the lab, then we pointed it to Saturn and then we actually did see the spikes of the signals of the detectors whenever we went over that planet. And then we know, okay, the system is now as good as we think it is, and now we can really start playing. So that was the, that was the real, real defining moment. You see that the telescope is moving. Now we're making what's called an x scan So the telescope goes from left to right, right to left, and gradually goes upwards. And somewhere in this square in the middle, there is Saturn. So we scan over Saturn from left to right and right to left. Uh, many times in here. Yes, it's a very bright source. There's nothing else possible that will be so bright in that area of the sky. Yes, it means that uh, the Shima works as a submillimeter wave detector on ASTE. We've already uh, cleared the baseline goal of the mission. That it worked there as good as here was for me already extremely fantastic. And it just got better and better. We had an extreme amount of, well, it was also very well prepared, but we were also very lucky. We didn't have a serious hiccup. So we did the whole commissioning plan and then we had still a month left. Yeah? So that's when we started to measure the higher redshift galaxies. Deshima produces a spectrum, submillimeter radio emission, radio emission at wavelengths shorter than a millimeter, decomposed into its uh, different colors. This is a spectrum of a galaxy which is not particularly bright. It's a fairly faint galaxy. And so it tells you how much molecular gas is there. It tells you the distance of this galaxy. It tells you how long ago this, uh, this, this light was emitted. And that is really the result that uh, gave me a very warm feeling when I saw it for the first time. To see that not very bright galaxy and such a beautiful, well-detected spectrum.
and then you know that you have a very good instrument on your hands. That is where we are now. And I'm, I'm very interested in the future. And not only will we be able to, to map the distribution of the dusty galaxies in the, in, in the distant universe, and therefore the history of the formation of galaxies, but also, since you observe the whole spectrum at the same time, that will tell you what the local conditions are in those galaxies. All of that is basically an unknown. And the submillimeter radiation that we observe has the fingerprints of those processes. So we can find those galaxies, we can pinpoint their distance, and we can understand their physics. Doing this in an efficient way is really revolutionary. It is the first time that this type of detector, namely the on-chip filter bank spectrometer, has ever captured any light from the universe. And we believe that this type of detector is going to be used more and more widely in the field. Because you open up a completely different way of looking at the universe itself. You learn about how galaxies are evolving and you're looking actually at the galaxies that are so far away in time and distance that the processes that are happening there, those are the processes that created the matter that makes up our planet, for example. But we have to go beyond that. We have to look at what we call first light in the universe. So now not first light of the instrument, but first light of the universe. The moment the first star went on to understand the beginning of what ultimately gave rise to us. I find that a moving idea to be able to search for that, to, to even contemplate that we can possibly see the light go on in the universe. But that is what we're talking about then. And there you heard Professor Paul Vanderwerth from Leiden University, Professor Johan Baselmans, a senior instrument scientist from the Netherlands Institute of Space Research, and Associate Professor Akira Endo from Delft University of Technology. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. <music> SpaceX says it hopes to fly its first crew aboard its new Crew Dragon 2 capsule in December. The new spacecraft, which will launch aboard a Falcon 9 rocket, will allow America to finally fly its own crew to the International Space Station without having to rely on Russian Soyuz rocket technology to get there. America's been using the Russian Soyuz ever since it mothballed the space shuttle fleet in 2011. No real planning had been done for a replacement. So NASA awarded a bunch of contracts to private companies to provide crew and cargo transfer services to the space station. SpaceX and Orbital Sciences ATK won the cargo contracts, SpaceX with a passenger version of its Dragon capsule called the Crew Dragon 2, and Boeing with a new spacecraft they've developed called the CST-100 Starliner, which will launch aboard an Atlas V rocket. Both Starliner and Dragon will be reusable and capable of transferring up to seven crew at a time between Earth and the space station. SpaceX have already carried out one unmanned test flight for their new Crew Dragon 2 capsule, successfully launching to the space station, automatically docking with it, and then returning safely to the Earth. The company had planned to carry out its first manned test flight this month, with regular crew transfer flights to the space station commencing by the end of the year. But those plans were all scrubbed following an explosion and fire which destroyed a Crew Dragon 2 capsule during a launch abort ground test at Cape Canaveral in April. The failure was eventually traced to a problem with the titanium valve system on the spacecraft's Super Draco rocket launch abort system. A fix has been developed, but it converts the Super Draco rockets from reusable propulsion systems to single use only. SpaceX have delivered another two and a half tons of supplies and equipment to the International Space Station. The flight, known as CRS 18, was the third mission for the same Dragon capsule. It had previously flown on CRS-6 back in April 2015 and CRS-13 in December 2017. CRS-18 blasted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida aboard a Falcon 9 rocket. The launch had been delayed by a day following a last-minute scrub due to bad weather. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Vehicle is pitching downrange. And there is successful liftoff of Falcon 9 carrying our 18th Power resupply nominal. mission uh, on a Dragon spacecraft to the International Space Station. Now we're currently in a what we call the throttle bucket, and that's because in about 30 seconds we have an event called maximum dynamic pressure, or max Q. 
That's the point where the vehicle, vehicle experiences the highest aerodynamic stresses. So what we do is we bring down the engines a little bit, pass through that point, and then throttle back up once the atmosphere continues to drop off above that point. Vehicle is experiencing maximum aerodynamic pressure. So now we're through that point of maximum dynamic pressure. Now coming up are a series of rapid events, a main engine cutoff, then stage separation, followed by second engine start of the second stage is Merlin vacuum engine. And then the first stage is going to conduct a boost back burn, followed by a dragon nose cone deploy. Now, main engine cutoff, or MECO, is where all nine Merlin 1D engines on the first stage will shut down. Followed shortly after that is stage separation. And then a few seconds later, the Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage will ignite to boost Dragon into low Earth orbit. In fact, uh, during ascent, you heard the call out for engine chill in of that Merlin vacuum engine. Nico. Stage separation confirmed. And back ignition. Stage one boost back startup. And you can hear the cheers behind me. Uh, that's a successful start of the Merlin vacuum engine and the boost back maneuver of the first stage. Shortly here, we should have nose cone deploy off of Dragon. We no longer need it now that we're out of the densest parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Our second stage on its way to drop off Dragon to its targeted orbit on the way to the International Space Station. Falcon 9 first stage on its way to Cape Canaveral, Florida landing zone 1 for successful landing. Our first stage had an on-time launch at 6.01 p.m. Eastern Standard Both Time just a few minutes ago. nominal trajectory. We had a nominal ascent, an ideal stage separation. We just performed the first of three burns of the first stage, the boost back burn, and we're a little more than a minute away from that second burn, the entry burn. In terms of fuel, fuel conservation, we only fire one Merlin engine on this final burn, engine number nine, the center engine. Stage one, entry transonic. Stage one, landing burn started. Our landing burn has begun. Stage two has entered terminal guidance. Landing laser deploy. deploying. Falcon and 9 has landed, landing off the Earth Procedure Low Note 100. And the Falcon has landed. Congratulations to everyone here at SpaceX for another successful landing. For those of you keeping score, this is our 44th successful first stage recovery. This is our secondary mission at SpaceX. It's our commitment to vehicle reusability. Back to our primary down. mission. So back to our primary mission. Nominal we, orbital insertion. We just had secondary engine cut off, and you just heard the call out for a good orbit. Uh, that's fantastic. That means that Dragon and the second stage are in low Earth orbit around the Earth. Now, the second stage does have one last major task for today's mission, and that's commanding separation of the Dragon spacecraft very shortly from now. Dragon separation confirmed. Acquisition of signal, Newfoundland. You can hear the cheers this is behind Dragon me. Dragon CC on countdown one. Dragon uh, senses separation. Off Dragon goes Thanks for, for the its. Ride mission to the International Space Station, the Dragon team doing a little handoff with Falcon there. Well, the Falcon 9's first stage returned to Earth performing a textbook landing on landing pad 1 at Cape Canaveral, the Dragon spacecraft continued to the International Space Station, arriving two days later. Upon rendezvous, Dragon was grabbed by the orbiting outpost Canada Arm 2 and berthed under the Harmony docking module. Sirius 18 delivered some 1,192 kilograms of scientific equipment and supplies, as well as 233 kilograms of crew supplies, 157 kilograms of vehicle hardware for the space station, 17 kilograms of computer equipment, and 157 kilograms of spacewalk equipment. The mission also carried the new International Docking Adapter 3. These new docking adapters are being attached to the space station Harmony Module's two pressurized mating adapter docking ports. They'll enable Dragon and Starliner spacecraft to dock autonomously with the space station. Dragon will remain docked to the ISS until August the 20th, when it will be undocked and then returned to Earth, carrying completed experiments and equipment. Science experiments included in the CRS-18 manifest include the multi-scale boiling experiment designed to use a laser to heat a refrigerant liquid in microgravity to trigger a vapor bubble. Astronauts will then use a grayscale camera to track the bubble's formation and growth, revealing the processes at work in order to better understand the seemingly simple but actually rather complex process. Also aboard is the BioRock experiment. It'll study how microbes feed on basalt, extracting ions for food and forming biofilm. Scientists want to understand how altered states of gravity affect this process. Another experiment will help scientists better understand the neurodegenerative effects of spaceflight. 
The amyloid aggregation experiment will try to understand why astronauts' post-flight brain scans show changes similar to those of elderly patients suffering from Alzheimer's. Meanwhile, a Russian Progress cargo ship carrying 2.7 tonnes of food and supplies has also successfully launched and docked with the International Space Station. But instead of taking two days to get there, it did it in just three and a half hours, two orbits. Second umbilical tower. Ignition has been started. Engines throttling up. And lift off. We have lift off of the progress. Progress 73 on its way in the fast lift to the International Space Station. Everything looking good so far. Those four strap-on boosters providing the initial lift of the vehicle will burn for 1 minute 58 seconds. Still getting some great views of this clear day in biking world. Everything looking good so far during this first stage ascent. At this point, the vehicle is traveling well over 1,000 miles an hour. Confirmed booster separation. Core stage will burn for another 3 minutes 28 seconds. Confirmation of launch shroud jettison. Now revealing the Progress 73 underneath. Still looking good, about 30 more seconds on this core stage. Good second stage separation and third stage ignition. And we have good third stage separation, third stage shutdown and separation from the vehicle. The flight was the latest test by the Russian Federal Space Agency at Roscosmos of their new fast track rendezvous system. The Progress 73 MS-12 capsule docked with the space station's Piers module 417 kilometers over northwestern China after launching on the Soyuz 21A rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. The Progress will remain docked to the space station for the next five months. It normally takes 34 orbits over two days for a spacecraft to catch up with and dock to the International Space Station, depending on timing. But Roscosmos have now got their timing and flight profiles down to a fine art. They've been developing and refining fast-track rendezvous over the past few years, initially introducing a four-orbit six-hour flight profile in 2012. And more recently, Moscow's been testing this new three-and-a-half-hour two-orbit fast rendezvous flight profile. Fast rendezvous aren't new. NASA used them during the Gemini program, with Gemini 6 meeting up with Gemini 7 just six hours after launch, and Gemini 11 docking with an Agena target vehicle just 94 minutes after liftoff. The former Soviet Union holds the record for the fastest rendezvous using two unmanned spacecraft. That's when Cosmos 213 docked with Cosmos 212 just 47 minutes after launch. Both these Cosmos craft were unmanned and remotely operated Soyuz capsules. The Progress MS-12 delivered 1,164 kilograms of dry cargo, including 394 kilograms of hardware for onboard systems, 38 kilograms of structural components and equipment, 7 kilograms of repairs and servicing equipment, 27 kilograms of medical supplies, a kilogram of personal protective gear, 190 kilograms of hygiene items, 282 kilograms of food, and 225 kilograms of what are known as miscellaneous items. Progress also carried tanks containing 420 kilograms of water, 51 kilograms of oxygen, 850 kilograms of propellant for the refueling section, and 880 kilograms of propellant for the integrated propulsion system of the International Space Station. It's been a busy time for the Russians, as well as Progress. They've also launched a new military communications satellite. It was also launched aboard a Soyuz 21A rocket, this one from the Placest Cosmodrome, 800 kilometers north of Moscow. The Meridian 18L communication satellite was deployed from the Soyuz Frigate M upper stage 140 minutes after launch. The Meridian 18L is the first of four new generation Meridian satellites ordered in 2016. The Meridian satellites are placed into elliptical Molniya orbits with apogees between 38,000 and 39,000 kilometers and perigees between 1,480 and 2,220 kilometers. They're designed to keep the spacecraft flying over high latitudes in the Arctic for as long as possible, in order to provide near-continuous coverage for Russian military forces across the high northern latitudes. Russia's also launched a new Meteor-M meteorological satellite, together with 32 smaller satellite payloads. This time, the launch vehicle was a Soyuz 21B, also equipped with a frigate upper stage. 
It blasted off from Russia's new Vostochny Cosmodrome in the country's far east, eventually placing its payloads into three separate orbits at 828 kilometres, 580 kilometres and 530 kilometres over the space of four and a half hours. The new Meteor M number 22 weather satellite was deployed into an 828 kilometre high polar orbit. It's designed to image cloud cover and surface ice and snow in visible infrared and microwave bands and record sea surface temperatures, humidity levels and ozone layer coverage. Following its deployment, the mission's secondary payloads were placed into either 580 or 530 kilometer high sun-synchronous orbits. These included microsats and cubesats for three Russian scientific groups, as well as Germany, France, the United States, Israel, the UK, Sweden, Finland, Thailand, Ecuador, the Czech Republic and Estonia. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. The World Meteorological Organization says July was the world's hottest month on record. It says the record temperatures are concerning because the previous month was the hottest June on record. It all means the planet is now on track for 2015 to 2019, becoming the five hottest years in recorded history. The findings are even more significant because the previous hottest month, July 2016, occurred during one of the strongest El Nino events ever recorded, and that wasn't the case this year. There's been an alarming surge in drug-resistant HIV over the last four years in Africa, Asia and across the Americas. A report in the journal Nature claims resistance is growing against efavirin and nevirapine, the two drugs that constitute the backbone of HIV treatment. Scientists are now recommending that doctors no longer use the same HIV drugs in areas where more than 10% of people with the virus have developed resistance. The World Health Organization is now recommending a new go-to HIV drug for those areas. They say the new drug, called Dilutgravir, is more effective and more tolerable than other therapies. Meanwhile, a new experimental mosaic HIV vaccine is about to begin trials. A report in the journal Nature claims the new vaccine, which promises longer-lasting protection, will begin late-stage clinical trials this year. More than 100 HIV vaccines have been tested on people over the past three decades, but only one has ever demonstrated any kind of real protection, and even that waned after just a year. One of the biggest challenges is the huge diversity of HIV strains circulating around the world. This new vaccine contains a disabled common cold virus, which carries synthetic HIV genes and proteins based on lots of strains from around the globe. Australian scientists are calling for oceana-wide action to safeguard shark populations at risk from overfishing. Macquarie University's Professor Rob Hardcourt says that while sharks are protected in Australian waters, they become at risk as soon as they leave them. A new global study reported in the journal Nature warns that even in the most remote parts of the world's oceans, migratory sharks, including great whites and makos, are now in severe danger from commercial fishing fleets. Scientists tracked the movements of 1,600 sharks using satellite tags and also monitored the movements of global fishing fleets to see where their paths crossed. They found areas frequented by protected species had much higher overlap with long-line fisheries, suggesting more protected areas might be needed to sustain these shark populations. Local shark hotspots were found to be in the South Australian Basin, northwestern Australia, the southern Great Barrier Reef, New Zealand shelf waters and around the Kemetic Islands. Hardcourt says declines in global shark populations have been noted for decades and calls for management strategies in the high seas have been growing. He says scientists are now warning that wider international engagement is urgent and essential. European researchers have developed a new model which predicts where in a volcano future eruptions are likely to occur. Current models are typically based on where previous eruptions have occurred and places where magma accumulates. In this new model, published in the journal Science Advances, researchers incorporated three-dimensional topography and the physics of magma transport. They then applied it to past eruptions at Italy's Campi Flegro Caldera in Naples, which other models had failed to predict, and it successfully estimated the eruption location. Well, if you're listening to this while driving at night and are being hit by a headlight glare, you may well be wearing yellow glasses, which have been touted for years as a way to improve night vision by reducing glare. But a new study has now cast some serious doubt on those claims. A report in the Journal of the American Medical Association looked at how 22 drivers using simulators responded to the sudden appearance of a pedestrian in their path. 
It seems wearing the yellow tinted glasses did not improve how quickly drivers spotted the pedestrians. And in fact, they may have actually been making things worse. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. 